Canadian soccer fans, happy Friday. Welcome back to The Hangout. One more show before we kick back and relax in what is hopefully a sun-filled, enjoyable weekend, whether you're able to get onto the balcony or the backyard, get out and enjoy the weather. And I apologize if you don't have clear, beautiful skies like you do in Ontario right now. I know where there is a place where it's pretty much always clear and beautiful, and that is in Orlando, which is where our guest today resides and flies his craft, Test Show. Akindeli joining the program today. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate you taking the time. Should be a fantastic half hour. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. And joining the program, as always, your regulars, Kurt Larson and Oliver Platt, who have nothing else to do. It's isolation time right now, but hey, they come in and give us their best every single day. Anyways, my name is Adam Jenkins. Let's get this show on the road. Tesha, we mentioned the weather. You got a young son right now. How are things in isolation going? Are you keeping everyone active and happy to the best that you can? Yeah, at the beginning, it was tough. There's a lot to get used to. And my, my wife, she actually works full time as an accountant. So she was at home working. I was full time daddy duty. So I was, you know, taking care of him, getting his food, put him down for a nap. Then I rush out to work out and then rush back by the time he wakes up and I'm back on dad duty. So it, it was hectic. You know, we kind of made tweaks here, there, got through it. But at the end of the day, it's, it's, it was just a cool time. You know, obviously, it, it sucks to be locked down. But I got to spend a lot of time with my son that maybe I wouldn't have otherwise. Got to take the best out of it. Absolutely. Well, Kurt, are you rushing out between daddy duty with Killian, getting all your workouts in three or four times a day? I am working out a little bit more now that the sun's out. Um, but no, it's been, it's been interesting because when we started this kind of period of isolation here in Toronto, my son was just eight months old. And I, th I think a lot of development happens between eight months and 11 months and, and walking and starting to babble and talk a little bit. So what we noticed was um, we actually took him into uh, a, another house for the first time a, a few weeks ago. And he started crying because he, he wasn't used to being anywhere else but our house. We've kind of taken a step back and said, maybe we need to get out a little bit more and, um, you know, kind of uh just just take different steps from everybody else okay, we're gonna we're gonna let kurt plug in and then hopefully that internet connection becomes a little more seamless ollie are you every time we have guests on with kids are you kind of thinking to yourself oh, i'm really not ready for that because i know that's how i'm feeling <laughs> um i don't know it makes my responsibilities feel a little uh less important like trying to figure out how i'm gonna get a haircut and why i need to how, how i can reduce my visits to the grocery store and stop ordering takeout and things like that so um, yeah, may maybe I'm not ready, but I, I, I'm not going to think about that just yet. All right, Tasha, we want to start the show today and focus on your time with Orlando City, where you are right now, and just that resurgence you had landing with Orlando City, scoring 10 goals in your first year with them after what had been, I don't want to say quiet, but it just seemed like it was a bounce back. The change of scenery really worked for you. What do you attribute that to? I would say it's a couple of things. One is just opportunity. I think I've always had the talent to score that many goals, but for whatever reason, you know, I wasn't playing as much as I did last year. Last year, I, I was able to play a lot of games and, you know, I scored a lot of goals. And then also, I would say, you know, my coaches really believed in me last year and my teammates as well believed in me. So, you know, even when I went through a few periods where I wasn't scoring as much, I felt just as confident because everybody was still sending me the crosses. They still believed I was going to be the guy scoring goals and, Having people around you believe in you makes a big difference. That's we know the goal scoring ability is there. Sorry, Ollie, but I just wanted to touch on too. You came into MLS on fire. I mean, rookie of the year. I mean, it was first Canadian to do that. Were you surprised by how quickly that success seemed to come? Yeah, it kind of came out of nowhere. And even my rookie year, I didn't play for the first couple months. I wasn't even in the 18. Uh, we had an injury to one of our star players. It changed up the way our our team played. We started playing with two forwards instead of one. So I got in the lineup and the rest is history. I'm just glad I came before Kyle Lahren because I would have had no chance <laughs> against his rookie season. I kind of, I got lucky. <laughs> yeah, I, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about Orlando City because they, they kind of remind me a bit of TFC in the early years. And uh, there seems to be you know, a really good fan base and enthusiasm around the team, but the success hasn't really followed on the field yet. And, you know, people can draw unfavorable comparisons with Atlanta and, and teams like that. What do you think the potential of this club is like if you can get a winner on the field and, and really give those fans what they've kind of been waiting for? I mean, the potential is huge for sure. Like you said, we have a great fan base. Um, I'm coming from Dallas where there was, you know, five major sports teams in Orlando. There's only us and a basketball team. 
So I think we're maybe more relevant in our market here than in Dallas. We're, you go all over the place. People have Orlando City bumper stickers, game day. Everybody all over the city is wearing purple. They're at the bars. And I think just that awareness is different than it might be in some other MLS markets. So if we're able to start producing on the field, making playoffs, you know, making championship runs, it'll, it'll be big here. Yeah. You're a guy who covered MLS for a long time. And I mean, how excited were you to see the Orlando Miami rivalry this year? Yeah. I, I, the, the exciting thing for me has been watching this league develop over the last 20 years. I mean, I, I started in Kansas city in 96 as a fan of that team, as a 10 year old, um, back in those early days, the league actually contracted almost immediately after expanding. So, uh, we actually lost a few teams in, including Miami. So basically to see what's happened since 2005, when Real Salt Lake came in followed by Toronto FC, and then just this explosion of soccer stadiums and new clubs and, and, and what you're seeing and Miami has been a part of that in Orlando as well has been, um, I think unexpected. I think if you ask anybody who was an MLS fan a decade ago or 15 years ago, if, if the league would look like this, they would have told you no way. Yeah. Show is there, it's easy to look at a map and draw rivalries based on locations. I think that's just the assumption when you have two teams in the same province or state, it just seems like there's going to be a rivalry, but for the players on Orlando city and just around whether it's digital or the content, did you feel like there was that bubbling? This is going to be a fun year to, to kind of kick this rivalry off. Yeah, for sure. And I think rivalries, a lot of time, it's it's fan-generated rivalries, you know, because players do switch teams a little bit. So you, it's the fans that are kind of poking fun at Miami or calling them FC Fort Lauderdale or, or whatever, you know. <laughs> so it, it's fan-driven, and you start to feel that energy. You see the jokes, and then you, you kind of get behind behind that, that fan energy. But it all starts with the fans, and Great, great rivalries are organic. You can't force them to happen. And I think that there probably is just organically a little bit of a rivalry between people from Miami and Orlando. So I'm, I'm looking forward to getting on the field against those guys. Tesho, did you feel like when you were in Dallas that, that Houston was your rival? I mean, I know obviously both cities being in Texas and then um, El Capitan and all that stuff. Or was, you know, FC Dallas more of a rival of a Seattle or someone like that? It's tough to say. Um, I would say when I was at Dallas, the players really had strong feelings against Kansas City. Oh, yeah. that, that was a tough one. We would we would go there and we were good the whole time I was in Dallas. We were a really good team, supporter shield contenders, and we won one time. And just we could not win at Kansas City. And they would come here and they couldn't or to Dallas they, they couldn't beat us. So those games to me were really heated from the player side. The fans definitely had strong feelings towards Houston, but I think player side, it was Kansas City for yeah. us. I mentioned earlier you have a young family right now. I want to ask you, what's more difficult, the transition from college to Major League Soccer or moving to a new city with a very, very young baby? Well, <laughs> it's crazy because when I moved, my baby wasn't even born yet. My baby was born four days after my wife got here. So that, that was a crazy time of my life, to be honest. Just, you know, I was in the off season. I wasn't sure where I was going to go. We had to move houses. My wife's pregnant. Luckily, it all worked out. But I would say that was a much more difficult transition because instead of just worrying about myself, I'm worried about my wife and yeah. my baby and everybody's health. So that was more difficult for me. I know what that's all about now, having been through it with my, with my first son. But one thing I never really had a chance to, to ask a player about is – how as a professional athlete do you cope with having, you know, an infant at home and, and the, the late nights, the early mornings, the middle of the nights? I mean, I know here in Toronto, Mick Hagland went through something similar where Coach Greg Vanny actually attributed maybe some of his poor performances to having a newborn at home. Um, so how did you handle that? Uh, I think that you got to take the time during the day to get naps, you know, because like you said, there's going to be nights where you're not going to be able to sleep. So if you can get home after practice and your kid's sleeping, definitely take advantage of that. And then I would also say it, it really helps to have a helpful partner. You know, my wife was extremely helpful, very understanding of like game, like the night of game days, for example, I wouldn't, I wouldn't wake up at all. She would wake up the whole time and take care of it. I would sleep in. So she, she, stepped up in a big way and made it a lot easier for me if, if she wouldn't have done that it, you know maybe I would have struggled a bit more so it was, it was thanks to that 
you two have any traditions before the game when he's able to come to the game? Is it like a high five or something you say to him? Or you see some professional athletes, especially I, the one that comes to mind is hockey because they can get right up to the glass and press their hands. But do you have any sort of traditions or superstitions like that? Not too much. But I mean, last time we really played a game, he was like seven months That's old. True. That's you very know, true. He's, he's older now, but it's been a while since we've played games. I'm hoping to build those. You know, I, I want I want him to just remember me as a soccer player because, you know, our careers will – they're going to end, you know, how, how many years do I have left? Five, 10 years. And I, I want him though, to remember me as a soccer player, remember going to my games and stuff like that. So I, yeah, I think building traditions will help with that. Yesterday we saw one of the funniest things on social media, soccer, social media in quite a while. Did everyone catch the FC Cincinnati slip up? You see that link I sent you guys? I saw it. Touch it. Did you see what happened? Yeah, no, I didn't catch it. So oh, come on, man. Okay. You'll, you'll have to check it out once we're done here. But basically, the, the short version is that they announced their new head coach with um, a little picture graphic, but it was the wrong picture. So it was like oh, it was, the, it was the old head coach, this picture, was it? it was, I, yeah, not, I don't know who it was. It was just some sure other was, kind of bald yeah, guy. Yeah. <laughs> it just looked like another bald white guy, and everyone on social media <laughs> took it and ran with it. So that was, yeah, welcome to welcome to Cincinnati. <laughs> yep, stom. Here's not Yapstam. So I ask you guys, if this was going to happen to you, whether Tesho, in your case, you go to another club or you guys, if one soccer ever did a graphic and mixed it up, who would you want your doppelganger to be that they tweeted instead? Or who do people say you look like from time to time? I don't know who people say I look like, but, I, you know, I'll take a Will Smith or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> people probably don't say I look like him, but I'll, I'll take that. I like his vibe. That's fair. That's yeah, fair. Always? Um, well, there is an actor called Oliver Platt, so I, I usually fall back on him. Um, I don't think I look much like him, but that, that would that's always my stock answer here. Uh, I don't know. Eric, uh, I think there's a there's a singer out there who, who looks a lot like me, but then I always forget his name, and I have to ask my wife, and now she's upstairs having lunch right now. So uh, what I have been doing is trying to wear my toque more like, you know, a David Beckham style. So I try and push it back on my head just a little bit more, let it, let it flow in the back. So maybe David Beckham, but let me come to the defense of FC Cincinnati's social media person. This has happened to me before when I worked at the newspaper at the Toronto sun, sometimes a photographer will mix up the name and the cut line. So when you search Getty or Reuters, sometimes if you search the right name, the wrong photo will come up. So my guess is the social media person had never seen a photo of Yapstam or knew who Yapstam was. And it turns out that the photo credit actually said it was Yapstam. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's happened to me before, albeit in a much lower profile environment. It is, it's quite easily done, but it, it kind of worked out for them because I think they got way more attention and, and engagement yeah, all, in their head coach all, all announcement. All publicity is good pu publicity, right? So <laughs> that's right. Maybe they right. did it on purpose. Who knows? Maybe. <laughs> That's, I think that's it's our growing controversy. Yeah, it's hilarious. Setup. It's great. What, what, however it happened, we're glad that it did. BBC, uh, okay, Sport, BBC Sport is tweeting about FC Cincinnati now. Like, yeah. everybody is tweeting about FC Cincinnati. It's been great for their brand. Worked out for them. All I'll say is that because my hair, as you can see, gets very poofy, I get um, Patrick Dempsey a lot. I don't know if I would fit in under McDreamy, but I get Patrick Dempsey and Kramer's another one. So those, are, those would be my two answers. Uh, okay, let's talk a little Major League Soccer since we have a pretty unique guest in the sense that you're in Orlando and that's where all of the reports and rumors seem to be stemming that when and if MLS is able to do a single site tournament, it will likely be at the Disney's Wide World of Sports or ESPN and Disney's Wide World of Sports. So, Tesha, what have you heard um, before we get into rumors and wild speculation? Let's ask the source first. What have you heard and what can you talk about? I mean, I've heard pretty much as much as the public has heard. I think they're writing great articles out there. I like the Athletic or Atlantic. Um, sorry, I'm not sure. Yeah, there's one The Athletic. Athletic, yeah, the athletic, athletic, yeah, the one, athletic yeah. yeah, The Athletic. They're writing great articles. I think that they know as much as we do. There's a talk of all the teams coming down, playing a little tournament, and then, you know, trying to find a winner. And, you know, from a player's point of view, we all want to play, of course, you know. And I think that right now it's just – the league and the players working together to come to a solution that makes sense. You know, they understand that this is a crazy time. We understand it's a crazy time for their business. They understand that it's a crazy time for our careers and our families. So everybody's trying to work together right now and hopefully we can find a good solution. Yeah. Well, I wanted to ask you about that Tesho, actually, because this does seem like the most realistic proposal and that you keep everyone in one place and maybe it's 
safer for not just for the people involved but for the population as a whole as well uh, and obviously there's an appetite to do this from fans and from us as broadcasters and, and people like that but what do you think especially as someone who has a young child about the idea of potentially being kind of locked away for you know six weeks two months um, and not being able to, to go into the outside world for such a long period of time I mean those are the concerns people are raising but I think you know everybody's working on it I you know, I think it would be difficult to be away from your family for a long time, but I see why yeah. that's a reasonable solution from the league. I can see both sides of it. I don't want to put myself out there too much as having a strong opinion. Like, I just I want to play soccer. I want to figure it out. You know, I think I think that we'll be able to come to a solution that will be fair for players who have families, players who are from different countries, players who have, you know, health concerns, whatever. I think we'll be able to come to a good uh, conclusion with that. I find, yeah. it I find it hard to believe that Major League Soccer and the Players Union won't find a way to, to make it as, as seamless for the players in terms of interacting with their own family and making things as comfortable as possible. I find that hard to believe. But you know what I don't want to hear from? I don't, I, don't, I, I don't want to hear from guys like Carlos Vela. I don't want to hear from the Alejandro Bedoyas. I don't want to hear from well, what I would call the more established millionaire players because, you know, What's the risk of those guys taking a few months off? I don't know. Maybe, you know, it's, it's probably quite a bit less than maybe your guys at the lower end of the pay scale who they want to get back to playing because they want to advance their career and become like those guys one day. So that's the first thing is I want to hear a little bit less from, from Carlos Vela and those guys. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I want to go. Sorry. I, I just wonder if there's a way to kind of meet in the middle where you maybe do three weeks of play and then a week or two off. And, and I guess that kind of compromises the whole quarantine aspect. But it, it does seem to me like as much as these some players like Carlos Vea do earn a lot of money and, and you, it's maybe easy to roll your eyes at them. I, I, I do think there are like there are genuine concerns about, you know, putting players in such a structured environment for so long and, and restricting them in that way. And also how that would affect the actual product on the field if you have players who don't want to be there, right? Yeah. And we're, well, we're talking about, too, for the CPL, it's obviously a, a microcosm of, of what's going on in Major League Soccer. But when it comes to resuming play up north, that a single site seems like it will be the most likely situation, barring some kind of miracle where this all clears up in the next five or six weeks. Uh, having said that, Kurt, uh, how realistic do you think that this could be? I mean, we've, we've heard coaches talk about it. I mean, the commissioner was even – on a conference call or joining the Atletico Ottawa fan party, talking about how there's interest from the club to do that, how he's been doing his homework, watching Bundesliga games. And then you have the other end of the spectrum where Rob Gale said in the Winnipeg free press that he thinks the idea sucks. So where do you think we are <laughs> realistically in that situation? Well, I would be surprised if Rob Gale didn't hear from somebody at the league on, on, on that or, uh, or I don't I don't know what was going on with that, but uh, no. That's not listen. even paraphrasing either. The quote is, "I think it kind of sucks." <laughs> yeah. So the interesting thing is that until the commissioner was on that, you know, at that fan event with Atletico Ottawa, we hadn't really heard too much concrete from the CPL and and what their plans were. But it's no secret that every single league, from the NHL to Major League Baseball to NBA, MLS everybody is talking about this single site solution. So I think, you know, you'd have to have your head buried to, to not think that that's probably one of the only realistic options for the CPL at this point. And I think the fact that the, the commissioner and, 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 and more, um, you know, leaders at, at the club level are talking about it indicates that that, that might be a direction they go. Yeah. And I think, I think in Canada, we potentially have some, advantages to be able to do that right like we don't have any teams outside of canada whereas mls obviously has two countries to work with we have some areas of the country where cases are fairly low um, and are obvious candidates for that kind of thing so yeah fingers crossed it does suck i mean let's go let's let's give rob a little bit of credit it does suck for a team like winnipeg if they have to you know <clears throat> you know not play in front of their <clears throat> excuse me not play in front of their fans and uh, and, and travel for two months, right? That, that does suck. But what doesn't suck is, you know, finding a way to get back on the field. Yeah, no, and that's, that's fair. Give credit to Rob Gale. It's just, that's just the quote, Rob. I mean, it's not an attack. It's just the quote. Okay, if this tournament does happen in Ottawa for Major League Soccer, obviously you're going to be surrounded Orlando? by... So, did I say Ottawa? I got CPL on the Thank you, Ollie. In Ottawa. Can that's... you imagine? Yeah, send, I know. Change your plans. We're going to Ottawa. <laughs> it's Friday, everybody. That happens. Um, okay, Orlando. That's the correct city that I'm looking for. If Major League right. Soccer does go to Orlando, your backdrop is going to be Disney World. So, the next pressing question is, if you could ride 
Um, am I mixing this up? We're, we're talking about NBA. Sorry. The NBA is also thinking about playing in Orlando, but they would actually be at Disney World. So if you could ride any of the rides at Disney World with an NBA player, who would you choose and why? Tesho, are you a big basketball fan? I'm a decent basketball fan. So which NBA player would I want to ride it with? Yeah, if you had to ride Space Mountain with an NBA <laughs> player, who would you be who would you be joining up with? I would pick someone like um I'd pick, I mean LeBron James is a pretty obvious pick, you know. So I'd maybe pick him. I'll pick the Greek freak too, because he's got Nigerian <laughs> roots and my family's got Nigerian roots, so maybe we could bond over that. That's a good nice. show. And you could probably become TikTok or Vine famous, whatever LeBron James is on right now, because he'd probably yeah. be live streaming the whole thing. <laughs> Shout me out real quick and my life changed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah do it, for, do it for the profile you know who's got the most instagram followers for, for the photo that goes up um uh well anyone who knows me well knows that i do not like roller coasters and you will not find me on space mountain um oh, even on, with Ali. even with an nba player but if i had to i i think i would probably want to go with someone on the smaller side you know he's going to take up less of kind of the seat next to me so i'm thinking maybe a chris paul or, or someone like that <laughs> Last time I was on a roller coaster, I passed out. It was back in, <laughs> it was back in the year. I think it was two thousand two ish, two thousand one. I haven't gone on a roller coaster since because I'm afraid I'll I'll pass out again. But literally, no, I'm not convinced they're safe. I, I'm not convinced they're safe as long as you don't have some kind of inner ear problem. So what happened was every time we went on a moderate drop or a big drop, my eyes just went black, and I was still present, but my eyes I could not see, and it was one of the scariest two minutes of my life. Um, so I would need the best NBA player in the world, the best basketball player in the world next to me, LeBron James. Uh, I, I think that, uh, when you're looking back 20 years to be able to say that you rode a roller coaster with LeBron James is, is far greater than saying you rode a roller coaster with Chris Paul. Even if yeah. you were passed out the entire time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I could still, I could still, I could still hear him. I could say, I'm like, you still there, LeBron? He's still there. <laughs> Talk me through this LBJ. <laughs> That's, yeah, a, true, that's gonna, a true story. Hershey Park, Hershey Park, Pennsylvania. I was there. It was a wooden roller coaster. It's terrifying. Roller coasters are amazing. Bungee jumping roller coasters, bring it on. I'm going to cheat a little bit. I would want to be sandwiched. <laughs> I'm going to be really careful how I say this. I'm going to choose two NBA players, retired NBA players. I want Charles and I want Shaq. I, I, didn't think know we I didn't know we could go out. retired, guys. So. Now you know how we <laughs> feel when you make the rules of the games, Kurt. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I want two guys who are just going to be like screaming and having the time of their lives with me on this roller coaster. I think that would be the best, best outcome for all parties involved. Okay. Um, since we're a little bit off topic, Tesh, I want to ask you, are your parents more proud of your pro soccer career or your education? Because you went to a pretty impressive school and you got a, a pretty tough degree. Was it engineering? Did you go for engineering at Colorado? Uh, I actually had to leave early, so I never graduated with engineering. I ended up graduating through SNHU because the, the league has a partnership with them now. So I got a I got a degree in general studies, and I'm going for my master's in finance right now. So I'm still in school. So do you get do you get more appreciation from the family about pursuing education still or being the professional athlete? Probably education, to be honest. My parents were really upset with me when I left uh, school, especially my dad was very upset with me when I left school before graduating because he's like you're so close to getting this degree you're gonna go for this wild shot obviously it worked out for me and I was able to still get a degree but I think I think that they're very education heavy and yeah that passed on to me so you're kind of a, a pretty unique case in a lot of ways because you you were at a division two school and and still you became a first round draft pick and, and rookie of the year um what do you think about kind of the way things are going now where there's seems to be less and less emphasis on the college path and, and more on kind of going through the pro academies yeah it's tough I mean I understand it from a de player development point of view like I think if you look at who are the best players ever they probably completely committed to soccer at the time they were 10 years old and they did nothing else you know but a lot of people are not going to be professional soccer players a lot of people are, are going to play up to a certain level and then they're going to go on with their lives so I think for me, college was such a cool experience. I think I matured a lot. I had to go away from home. I, you know, I had to just take care of myself. I met a lot of cool people who are my friends for life now, people that were in my wedding. And I, so I, I hate to see it go away from college, but I do understand it from a player development point of view because you know, I think some of the best players will be created in these just pro academy systems. Yeah. Well, you went to school and you were successful playing obviously as well 
numerous All-Americans. Would you do it all again, though, With as Ollie mentioned, with the way things are sort of shifting away? Do you think you'd make the same decision now? I mean, in that environment, I for sure would. Um, it's tough to say now because, like, honestly, even the, the academies barely started. You know, I was, like, 16 or 17 when they started playing, like, when the Rapids got an academy. So I was already about to go to college. And half of the good players went, half of them did not go. So it's hard to say what I would do now, but back then I would I would make the same choice a hundred times over because I had I had a really great college experience. Mm-hmm. Joshua, we Give, can't let uh, you go without ignoring uh, your international career. But Kurt, do you want to pipe in first? Yeah, I want to change my answer to Dennis Rodman. <laughs> <laughs> He's still thinking about it. <laughs> that, that, wasn't, <laughs> no, that wasn't why I wanted to pipe in. That wasn't what I, why I wanted to pipe in. No, but think about it, like Dennis Rodman. Chances are you're going to have a full day with him as well. I'm going out party, and I'm who knows what who knows what happens next. Like I'll be in North Korea. Um, I'll take the question from the chat. Vince Alvarado asks, um, just on you know Tesho with with being eligible to play for the United States and Canada, and and I, I believe at one point rejecting a call to play for Canada am I correct I did one time yeah so wh- what was that what was that like that can you just give us your thought process and, and what you're going through in, in that kind of 2014 2015 period of your career when you were um I, I believe called into at least one U.S. camp but then ultimately at the end decided to play for for Canada that I mean it was just a whirlwind of a year you know I went from like you guys said a relative nobody playing in division two soccer in Colorado to I became the rookie of the year I became a U.S. citizen that year actually too and then you know I'm getting calls from Canada and the U.S. it was just a lot going on Um, and I think you know in those types of situations it's good to look at all the options think what's the best choice for you and I I think that's what I did I'm really glad that I decided to play for Canada I think it's worked out great for me and and honestly like like I said I became a U.S. citizen in 2014 so my whole life up until then I was Canadian always, and I had never even considered playing for the U.S., you know, so a lot of people say, what, you know, why did you end up choosing Canada? Because that's all I had ever thought about my entire life is when I thought about national team soccer, it was always Canada because I was just Canadian. I was not American until I was, you know, 22 years old. Yeah, you came into the team at at an interesting time, too, with Benito Floro, and there's, there's, a lot of stories about his process and, and maybe his, his uniqueness as a, as a manager. Uh, I see you smile there, so you know what I'm talking about. And then Octavio Zambrano comes in, and now John Herdman, and I think you've had a little taste of John Herdman. So what's that, um, you know, half dozen years been like to see the evolution of Canada from from then till till now with John? Yeah, it's been it's been really crazy, very impressive. Um, like you said, we've gone through a lot of coaches who have very different styles. But I think more than that has been the change in the player pool. Like when I first came in, you know, five or six years ago, we had a pretty good team, but I think that there just wasn't too much depth, too much competition for spots. So maybe people could get into camp, even if they weren't performing at their best, you know, just kind of off of legacy. But right now, if you're not, if you're forward and you're not scoring every other week, you're not getting called in because, you know, Jonathan David's scoring every single week. You know, if you're a defender and you're not starting every single game for your team, you're not getting called in, whereas that maybe wasn't the case before. So just to see how the competition for spots and the depth of the whole player pool has changed has been great. And I think Canadian fans should should really look at, just really think about it. That's It's been five or six years and our player pool has completely changed. A lot of good players. It's it's really good. It's really, really good for the future. So this has been a really fun half an hour. Wish we had a bit more time, but we'll have to follow up with you after things have sort of returned a little bit more to normal. But thank you so much for taking the time. All the best and good health to you and your family. Thanks for having me, guys. Nice to talk to you. Thanks, Tesho. Thanks, Tesho. Tesho Akindeli joining us on the One Soccer Hangout. Thanks, everyone, for another fun week here on the Hangout. Stay tuned to the One Soccer social channels. We'll be posting some of the best clips of the week and subscribe to the channel and share these videos if you haven't done so already with a friend. Share the love. Thanks to Kurt, Ollie, producers Armin, and Lucas. I'm Adam Jenkins. Enjoy a fantastic weekend, and we'll talk to you on Monday.